Hello, everyone, and welcome. As people start to trickle in, we're going to play ULI Toronto's membership video. Having the ability to exchange stories, exchange ideas, and, and really sort of find mentors in the industry via ULI was a huge plus for me. So one of the things that I first started doing with ULI um, in terms of active engagement was with their urban plan program. And for me, that's, they, they basically go into schools and work with um, young people in junior high and high school. One of the great things about ULI is that it provides a, a great platform for public sector and private sector interests to meet. So it's an opportunity to connect with a variety of people from a variety of different disciplines. So I work in real estate development, but it's useful and important to get to know people in other aspects of city building. The opportunity to get recognition, the opportunity to participate in my community and give back in a way. All of those things have enhanced my career and I think enhanced what I'm able to offer the industry. I'm really excited to be part of ULI Toronto and really advancing my leadership skills and fostering my connections and really just advancing uh, my mission for city building. I was a young professional, new to the province, and I found ULI and other kind of similar organizations really helpful in terms of you know, bridging connections and networking. It's an opportunity to, to connect with people who have questions, who, are, who have not quite figured out how to do things. And I liked how hands-on you could be as a member. You could get involved immediately, you can volunteer. For me, ULI is one of the greatest organizations in the world and certainly in Toronto to connect, to learn and to become a part of an organization that really values its people and its members. Our membership video, which you just saw, is our uh, invitation for you to get more involved with ULI Toronto, which is the world's largest and most active ULI chapter. A few notes to ULI members or those who are not yet members. You can access ULI's network uh, through the global membership directory. There are exciting engagement opportunities on local ULI committees, which are available through the Navigator tab as well as our annual window, uh, which is in May for joining committees. You can access upcoming and past events and attendees, which is an amazing networking tool, as well as an unbelievable wealth of knowledge of local and global ULI resources, archives, case studies, past webinars, and more through the Knowledge Finder. We'll provide links to what you can expect from your membership, and to learn about all the benefits, check the link in the chat. My name is Kelly Graham. I am a planner at SVN Architects and Planners and a member of ULI Toronto's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee and a co-lead of today's program. As you know, today's webinar event is Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Reconciliation in the Official Plan innovative approaches to addressing systemic inequities in land use policy. Due to limited time, we will not have an audience Q&A session in the webinar, but after the webinar ends, you'll be prompted to answer a quick survey and you'll also have the opportunity to submit any questions or comments to help us shape a follow-up workshop that we'll be hosting in the fall. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the people who were here before this land was settled. As a Toronto region-based organization, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, and newcomers in this generation or in generations past. We'd also like to acknowledge and honor those who came here involuntarily, particularly those who descended from those brought here through ensla enslavement. 
To better understand the meaning behind this land acknowledgement, we recommend four programs that we have uploaded on YouTube and these links are available in the chat. Today's event and all other ULI programming would not be possible without the support of our annual sponsors. I would like to say a major thank you to all of them for their support with specific acknowledgement to our diamond sponsor and our diversity, equity and inclusion sponsor and Ellis Dawn for their continuous support. Now more than ever, ULI Toronto relies on our sponsors to put high quality programs and to dr drive the mission to support the future of the built environment for transformative impact on communities worldwide. To all of our sponsors, we thank you. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass the mic to Junija Varghese, the Interim Director of Community Connections at United Way of Greater Toronto. Junija, we'd love to have you open our event today with some opening remarks and insightful context. Uh, hello everyone, um, Kelly and ULI team, thank you for inviting me and uh, having me as part of this exciting event. Um, since uh, having immigrated to Canada about 10 years ago or so, I've uh, had the opportunity to be on a, a learning and reflection journey that uh, brought about uh, questions like, whose land is this? Uh, who gets to shape it? And during this time, one of the things I've really come to appreciate is this philosophy from the uh, Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee people, which is uh, to consider any decision, not just for the current generation, but for the next uh, seven generations. And the way I see it, official plans and land use policies in its essence is about looking at shaping our cities and neighborhoods uh, for both current and future residents. But in order to meaningfully and intentionally do that, diversity, equity, inclusion, reconciliation, writing our relations need to be integral to planning in both shaping the policies and plans, but also in their implementation. Now, uh, while I'm not a planner, um, through my role at United Way, I have the privilege of working in neighborhoods undergoing redevelopment and revitalization. Uh, our Building Strong Neighborhood Strategy that I uh, help implement in the uh, Greater Toronto Area builds on this understanding that there are inequities in neighborhoods uh, resulting from things such as systemic racism and historic um, underinvestment that uh, over the years have led to poor social and uh, physical infrastructure, concentrated um, pockets of poverty in neighborhoods and tower buildings, all of which we wanna see changed. So uh, we partner with uh, community organizations and residents to help them shape their neighborhoods in a way that meets their vision and hopes for the place. And um, one of the communities we work in is in the eastern part of Toronto called Scarborough, um, that is undergoing quite a bit of transit infrastructure development and in turn has stimulated uh, redevelopment of the broader set of neighborhoods and is anticipating at least 40,000 new residents to move into that area in the next 20 to 30 years, which is huge uh, for, uh, for this place. And, and we have been supporting the local community in their efforts to develop a community benefits framework that articulates not just their vision for this redevelopment, but also uh, how it impacts the diverse cross-section of people in the community and what opportunities residents can benefit from. And when you immerse yourself in community, they teach you a thing or two or 10, um, especially about how they experience policies and plans in their life. And, and the key things that were highlighted, at least for me, were the who, the how, and the when. Um, the who, like who are the plans and policies for? Whose dreams and needs are reflected in them? Uh, whose voice is heard and whose isn't? And more often than not, um, there's a disproportionate number of racialized peoples and those impacted by systemic inequities who don't see themselves and their families in the local plans. We know that not everybody experiences a, a community or a city uh, in the same way. Those living in uh, social housing, um, those experiencing a disability, those um, single moms juggling multiple jobs and trying to figure out childcare in order to participate in a council deputation or a, a secondary uh, plan consultation. Like we've heard this quite frequently. And they're the ones who could really shed light on what kind of affordable housing needs to be there, um, the need for accessible spaces and important community services, um, their hopes for opening up a, a small business storefront or the need for culturally relevant um, food options. And they're also often the ones who are left in a tough spot of 
potential displacement or not being able to fully experience um, the benefits of changes. So um, the purpose behind um, community-led projects such as the Community Benefits Framework was looking at how we can amplify the voices of historically underrepresented groups in determining the design and future of the place they live in. And of course, feed that back to the local planning units, developers, city councilors, and other stakeholders. Um, but as someone who speaks multiple languages, I have to say, planning is a language of its own. It's beautiful, um, but in order for community to meaningfully participate in planning conversations, um, they need to kind of understand that language a bit. So uh, one of our funded community groups did a couple of um, planning 101 capacity building sessions with residents on, on things like land use policy, official plans, inclusionary zoning. And, and this was in a location that had seen quite an influx of Syrian refugees in the last few years. And the group wanted to make sure these folks were engaged um, because they too are part of the makeup of the neighborhood. Um, so they brought in Arabic translators and I was part of the session as well, but here's what we found. Uh, it was really challenging to translate planning terms into Arabic and other different languages. And I don't know if any of you've tried that, but this actually brings us to a much more broader question about how do we make sure we meet community where they're at? How do the plans, policies, processes account for unique barriers that different populations face? And finally, what we heard from community, it's about the when. Um, I cannot take any credit whatsoever for this illustration I'm going to share with you because I, it's actually from an article that I read a couple months back, uh, which talked about the fact that we often engage community asking about what kind of frosting they want on a cake that is already baked. So if someone asks, when should reconciliation, diversity, equity, and inclusion be brought into the process, it begins even before deciding the cake right from the start and every step of the way, the policies, the community engagement, the decision-making and everything in between. Now, I know not all of this is gonna get discussed today and it shouldn't because it's, this is meant to be an ongoing conversation of unpacking, learning and sharing. And I can't wait to hear um, the insights and wisdom from uh, all our amazing panelists who, um, who are bringing that um, lens from uh, the different communities they're working in across the US and Canada. So um, Kelly, passing it off to you and thanks everyone. Thanks, Janine, uh, for providing some context for today's conversation and reminding us about who we're planning for and with. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Cheryl Case, who is founder and principal urban planner of CP Planning, as well as a, an early career Canadian le urban leader at the School of Cities of the University of Toronto. She'll introduce our speakers and lead what promises to be a very illuminating panel. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, it is a great honor to be the moderator for this conversation. Um, when the ULI DEI committee um, looked at hosting this conversation, we had a list of our ideal folks to uh, speak about their experiences in uh, municipal planning with a DEIR focus. And we are really excited that actually our top picks all uh, agree to be here tonight. So uh, as far as we know, we, these are the best of the best in terms of North American leadership in uh, incorporating diversity, equity, inclusion, and reconciliation um, in terms of addressing systemic discrimination against uh, Indigenous people in, um, in North America in planning. So we have uh, for our panel, we have Juan Sebastian Arias, who is a deputy director policy at the mayor's office in the city of Chicago. Uh, from Minneapolis, we have Joe Bernard, planning project manager uh, city, um, and we have Port from, in Portland, we have Lisa Aboif, director of development and investment at Prosper Portland. And finally, we have Laura Rampel, planner, urban planning and design division at the city of Winnipeg. And so with that, um, we'll have our first presentation uh, while, where each of these amazing panelists will share about the work that they've been doing in their cities to incorporate DEIR into planning and uh, take away Juan Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you um, to ULI Toronto as well for um, the invitation to join today. So again, my name is Juan Sebastian Arias. Uh, currently working as a deputy director of policy in the mayor's office. And what I uh, am here to talk about, uh, at least try to cover um, in, in, uh, in a few minutes, is the city of Chicago's first ever equitable transit-oriented development policy plan or ETOD policy plan. Um, the reason why I think this is relevant for the conversation today 
is because um, Chicago has had a TOD policy uh, uh, zoning uh, policy on the books since 2013. Uh, not until last year did, did we actually develop an equitable TOD policy plan. Uh, as someone was mentioning earlier, earlier right, um, we know that uh, when equity is not centered at the beginning of baking the cake, um, uh, it, it, that cake or that policy in this case uh, will only serve to exacerbate some disparities. And that's actually the impetus of what, what drove us as a city to recognize we need to actually focus on the equitable part of our TOD work. So if we go to the next slide, um, with that background, this is a little bit of just some of the data behind what we were starting to look at, what, what some of the problems were they were trying to solve. Um, again, as I mentioned, Chicago's had uh, a, a, a TOD zoning uh, ordinance on the books since 2013. The map here on the left shows all the developments that have taken advantage of some of the development incentives since 2013 um, uh, near transit. And as you can see, uh, there is a, um, a, a huge disparity in where we're actually seeing TOD development happening in the city. Um, you, um, you, may all, you all may or may not be familiar with uh, the city of Chicago. Um, if you look at this map, um, everywhere you see activity happening are the uh, parts of the city that are wealthier, that are wider, and parts where you do not see any TOD uh, activity happening is largely in communities of color. Um, so a lot of the South and West sides, uh, which are majority black and historically disinvested communities. So this is one of the issues that we started to, that, that, we, that we recognized that we needed to, um, but one of the reasons why we knew we needed to um, actually be specific about how are we gonna advance equitable TOD in the city and not just something that, and not just have a policy that, re, that uh, reinforces these disparities. If we go to the next slide, this is another um, example of some of the, uh, or yeah, another example of some of the challenges that we are also looking to address. Um, in Chicago, we have uh, what we, as in many cities, we're facing some displacement um, challenges and pressures. And we like to think about this in two ways or the two sides of displacement. Um, Chicago, again, uh, has a number of different communities that are uh, have different market pressures or um, seeing different investment levels. And some of the outcomes of that that we're seeing is that in some neighborhoods, some uh, a good number of majority Latinx communities that are seeing some rapid investment um, uh, and growth, especially near transit, we're seeing a lot of displacement. So Logan Square is just one example of, of that. On the flip side, we also have a lot of displacement happening caused by disinvestment um, in the majority black parts of the city. So this is also some of the framework or some of the challenges that we, that we had in mind as we embarked on this journey to develop uh, the city's first ever ETOD policy plan. If we go to the next slide, um, this, this uh, tells a little bit or shows like a snapshot of a bit of the journey that we went through to get to this point. Um, uh, to just gloss over it some, uh, relatively quickly and happy to, to say more during the, during the discussion. Um, in 2019 was the most recent update to the city of Chicago's TOD ordinance. We have a very strong um, coalition who are close partners of ours uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the mayor's office too, who advocated for uh, that ordinance to include a mandate uh, for the mayor's office and, and city departments to develop an ETOD policy plan, recognizing, um, looking, at the, looking at the data, some of the data that I just showed and also um, some other, uh, some other key indicators um, and uh, actually working through a, a, a community driven process, a collaborative cross sector process to develop a plan for how we would, how we would change our policies, our programs um, and, and other strategies for advancing equitable goals. Um, in Chicago, we do define equity as both an outcome and a process. And so this is also why I wanna highlight the process that we went through. So in close partnership with our co with Elevated Chicago, uh, we formed this working we formed a working group uh, which grew over time to be over eighty stakeholders, including uh, which included funded uh, members of community based uh, neighborhood organizations as well as citywide um, and regional um, organizations as well. Um, fast forward to you know a year and a half work we put we had a draft policy plan that we put out for public comment. And then finally, this last summer, June 2021, uh, we uh, finalized the policy plan and had it approved and adopted, took it to the Chicago Plan Commission to be approved and, and, and adopted. 
Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, just to give a, a snapshot also of some of the goals that we articulated within, within this ETOD policy plan, um, uh, our vision for ETOD in the city of Chicago is that every person, regardless of their income, their, their disability, their race, gender, um, et cetera, should be able to benefit should be able to benefit from um, the from TOD or from uh, dense pedestrian oriented development and and communities themselves and the re and the ways that we recognize we need to do this uh, looking across all the different kinds of Chicago communities that there are are what's up here on the slide one being increasing investment in new development and in capital infrastructure near transit in the disinvested parts of the city so largely in the 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 south and the west sides for example. Uh, at the same time, we recognize we need to prevent displacement in neighborhoods that are seeing rapid growth, which I talked about a little bit as well. And then on the uh, on the uh, the third piece here is around promoting affordability and diversity of housing options and tackling some of the exclusionary zoning that makes it um, that makes a lot of transit rich neighborhoods and part of the city high cost uh, and um, inaccessible for a lot of Chicagoans. So this is just a snapshot of some of the goals that we articulated. Um, if you go to shy.gov slash ETOD, you can find a whole lot more. There's plenty of more policy recommendations that we're working to implement now. Um, and I think I might be more or less at my time. So I'll, I'll probably pause it there, but looking forward to the, to the discussion. Amazing, thanks so much, Juan Sebastian. Um, there's a lot of intersections I can see there with, uh, for example, Little Jamaica, where we've seen the black population decrease quite a bit along the Edmonton LRT. So again, seeing this connection between Chicago and Toronto and how we can maybe bring in some of that here. So next we have uh, Joe Bernard from Minneapolis. How are you? Hi, thank you, Cheryl. Good morning from Minneapolis. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm excited to share some of our experiences with equitable planning with you and to hear from these other great speakers. It was good to hear uh, Juan Sebastian, uh, some really familiar themes that are happening in Chicago. Uh, my name is Joe Bernard. I'm a planner with the city of Minneapolis. A few years ago, I served as a co-project manager for a citywide planning process. Uh, sounds similar to the one that Toronto is facing here. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar, Minneapolis is at the center of a metro area that has a relatively strong regional governance uh, for a U.S. metro. We are required by state statute to update our citywide comprehensive plan every 10 years. It addresses all manner of things that the city is responsible for. Um, that being said, the focus of these plans is often on accommodating growth uh, through new development and how our city will do that through policy and regulatory powers. Next slide, please. Very early on in our process, we asked the public and our elected officials what the focus of this planning effort should be. They made it abundantly clear uh, that we needed to evaluate all of the city's proposed future work through an equity lens. Um, for us, that meant adopting, uh, we adopted six values and 14 goals that we would use to evaluate policy for how housing, jobs, transportation, and all other uh, vital systems would be supported by the city over the next 20 years. First, that meant prioritizing our outreach efforts on communities and supporting voices in communities that have been telling their story for years, um, and which is unfortunately in many cases, stories of systemic marginalization by the government and other institutions that have resulted in Minneapolis being home to some of the biggest gaps in wealth, income, education, health, et cetera, between our white residents and our black, indigenous, and re other residents of color. Next slide, please. Touching on just one of the examples from the plan, uh, we worked with communities to tell the story of, um, you'll see here from uh, left to right, uh, we told this story of redlining, where in the earlier part of the 20th century, non-white residents could not qualify for a loan in areas where they lived and were barred from housing access in whiter neighborhoods. We told the story of racially restrictive covenants, where deed restrictions on properties made it impossible to sell or rent land or housing to people of color. 
And we told the story of how single family zoning was used as suggested by our federal housing authorities as a means to limit access to housing op opportunities for people of color. These practices work together over time to restrict access to opportunities for wealth building, access to the best parks and schools, and locations that afforded residents transportation op options for accessing uh, better jobs. These practices didn't just end 60 years ago. Black Americans were unequally issued loans with unfavorable terms leading up to the 2008 housing bubble. And still today on a national level, homes in majority black neighborhoods are undervalued by $48,000 per home on average. The result in Minneapolis is an incredibly se segregated community by race, as you can see on the rightmost map here, and by nearly every outcome uh, you can imagine. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to focus these opening remarks on process today, um, but I'm happy to serve as a resource moving forward regarding what we did specifically to address um, some of these harmful histories, and you can find that at Minneapolis2040.com as well. Um, what worked for us process-wise is outlined on this slide. Um, I want to emphasize, please spend ample time developing consensus on the outcomes you're hoping to achieve at the front end. Uh, do this by prioritizing engagement with stakeholders that are most impacted by the work. Get your elected officials to formally recognize these goals early in your process so that everyone, staff, stakeholders, elected officials can be held accountable to those uh, goals throughout your process and then beyond into implementation. Um, you want to acknowledge that if you want different outcomes uh, in the future, you want to get people to uh, acknowledge that reality that if you want a different outcome, you're going to have to change past practices that got you here. So, so uh, a solutions-based um, process. And then set up accountable structures uh, so that you can change course in the future as needed to stay on track in achieving your goals. So with that, I um, uh, look forward to our discussion um, uh, with questions for, for the panelists, uh, but I'll turn it back to Cheryl. Amazing. Thanks for those great uh, little lessons there, the process lessons. I hope people are taking note. Uh, so next we have uh, Lisa Aboif from Portland. So for me, I'm going to say, oh, for me, I'm going to say good morning to you all because I know it's afternoon for you. For me, it's still morning. So I'm Lisa Aboif. I am the Director of Development Investment with Prosper Portland. And I go by she, her, hers. Next slide, please. When I thought I'd set the stage a little bit of who is Prosper Portland, it's not always self-evident to um, folks who work in either city planning um, or policy development. Prosper Portland is the economic development and community-based development agency for the city of Portland. We are implementation focused. So based on what you've heard from some of our earlier speakers, we really take long range policies and plans and we put them into action largely um, with kind of community-based work and financial tools. We have a very close working relationship with any number of the city of Portland's bureaus, including our Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, who hands down long range plans from um, economic development related plans to community development related plans. And then we move those into implementation on the commercial side. And what I'm showing here is our strategic plan that really is at the core of all of our work. We have five strategic priorities and what you'll note at the heart of all of those is building an equitable economy. So given the history of our agency, we were the urban renewal agency for the city of Portland, really kind of owning that history and the obligations uh, to do better and to improve. Um, we have centered equity in all of our work. What you see um, growing from there is we have five key goals with particular measures that we've set to those. And though the, I'm gonna summarize them at a high level, we have programs and activities that support accessible um, job growth within the city of Portland. We have a goal around equitable wealth creation that really focuses on wealth creation that comes through business ownership as well as property ownership. Um, we have a goal around healthy, complete neighborhoods. So we work really closely with our housing bureau as well as our infrastructure bureaus to really understand some of the equity impacts and potential displacement impacts that our investments as a city can have. And then um, one of the things that we'll talk probably a little bit more about later on is we can't do this alone. Clearly all of our work, given the fact that very often we are implementing our work with private or nonprofit partners really takes partnerships to implement, let alone partnerships on the city side. 
And then last but not least is effective stewards of public funds, but also of how we think about equity internal to the agency as we change our work externally. Next slide, please. So often for folks who look at our work from the outside, people to, we, we talk about ourselves as an elephant where people are touching different parts of the elephant, but not necessarily seeing the whole. So I thought it would be helpful to share a little bit about um, the comprehensive set or suite of programs that we offer um, from business technical assistance, small business support that includes direct um, small business grant support, as well as um, resourcing community capacity, particularly with culturally specific technical assistance providers to support business development and uh, small business growth. We have programs in workforce development. We work with our regional workforce training provider um, and really focused on folks who haven't had access um, to equitable workforce opportunities. We have a, programs around community capacity building, really firmly believing that community development relies on the capacity and stability of resources within community. So we have what's called the Neighborhood Prosperity Network Initiative that funds district managers in particular communities of Portland that are at high risk of displacement. And then they provide direct leads to either workforce small or small business programs. We offer direct financial support through loans and grants. And then last but not least, we also have the ability to buy and sell land and then operate land in particular ways. And so what's highlighted here is just some of the outcomes and how we measure ourselves against the goals with a particular equity lens. So you see both kind of the total numbers, but also a percentage breakdown of um, communities of color that are being served from our technical assistance programs through to our financial programs. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to touch on two kind of case studies um, in preparing for this conversation this morning. One, I thought it would be helpful to share a little bit of how do we internally do this work? How have we changed as an agency, particularly over the past five, 10 years to really um, further the goals that we set out for ourselves in our strategic plan. And then the next one I'll talk about is a, pr a particular project that we have underway. So we rely on public-private partnerships for much of our work. Um, and it's really, um, this is really true when we go to buy or sell land or redevelop land. Largely our tool is to buy land and then we put it out for a request for proposal. And we're often faced with balancing both financial and community returns on public investments. Historically, our internal review committee that would look at those land transactions or those investments focused exclusively on financial, financial policy outcomes. And over the past couple of years, we've pivoted that financial investment committee to actually be a committee for accountability on both fi our financial policies as well as our equity policies. And we started to put in place tools that would support staff on a pretty systemic way to negotiate those investments or those land transactions. And it was also our goal to be more intentional and transparent in how we're negotiating our interests and what our goals really are on a project by project basis not only with the development community, whether those are private or nonprofit development partners, but also with the community where we're doing our work. And so what you see on the right is a lens that our staff will fill out for each disposition of real estate property. So we'll buy a piece of property, we'll, we'll work with the community to really identify what its priorities are, we'll identify the budget and budget availability for us to invest in that land as well as the land value, and then staff will fill out this, um, this matrix that starts with baseline priorities on all land transactions, whether we're making a public investment or it's just a fair market um, transaction will require our business and workforce equity goals as well as green building. Scaling up to projects where we may be investing a certain amount of public resources, but not significant resources, um, which really requires us to be in community and understand what community informed priorities and outcomes are all the way scaled up to when we're making really significant investments on behalf of the city of Portland, making sure that um, not only are we negotiating those public benefits, but we're actually negotiating them into an agreement that has accountability and oversight as part of that um, discussion. Given the history of our agency, again, as the Urban Renewal Agency, we're really leaning heavily, and I can come back to this later in part, as part of our discussion, in just trust building. There is a, a kind of a long tail of the impact that we've had as an agency, and we're needing to rebuild those, those relationships and that trust with community as we identify what community priorities are. 
Next slide, please. And then another example that I thought I would share today with you is um, how we're thinking about our projects differently. And so what you see on the left is how we've thought about large scale, significant redevelopment opportunities in the city of Portland in the past, and how we're looking at a key opportunity that we have in front of us today. So Prosper Portland has been involved. If any of you have been to Portland, um, there's key areas of the city in the Pearl District and South Waterfront that were major redevelopment on historic industrial lands, very successful on kind of a tax increment basis perspective, but was not intentional about who benefited and who was impacted um, by those new developments. So as we undertake this new project called Broadway Corridor, we're really trying to be intentional in centering equity in our processes. And as many of our speakers have mentioned, starting early has been key. Um, this is a site that is adjacent to Portland's major regional uh, rail station. It's also a site that's right next to Old Town, which is historically one of our oldest communities. It, was, it, um, it is adjacent to the Willamette River which is the site for indigenous settlements. It, it was a particularly important location for early immigrants coming into Portland and Oregon, particularly Portland's Chinese American and Japanese American communities. And it was actually one of Portland and Oregon's earliest social centers for our black community tied, tied to the rail borders coming in through Union Station and a place where African-Americans could gather in a segregated and unfriendly city and state. So we undertook a racial equity impact assessment early on. We took a look at our past projects. What you see on the left is kind of how we've done it in the past and an, a self-assessment that we did. And then we took a step forward and said, okay, how can we be more intentional about who can benefit and who is impacted as we think about future redevelopment of this Broadway corridor area? And I wanted to highlight two um, kind of major takeaways that came from this racial equity impact assessment that we did looking back and then looking forward. One is we identified that there were key um, nonprofits within Old Town uh, who were at risk of displacement. So we actually helped a number of nonprofits in Old Town um, to purchase a, a location for them to stay permanently. And that's the Japanese American Museum of Oregon and the Portland Chinatown Museum. They were leasing. They were at risk as we made investments as the city that their leases could increase. So we helped them um, purchase and improve uh, a location where they can be permanently. And the other thing that we have, uh, the other element that we have actively under negotiation is a community benefit agreement with anticipated public investment of 100 million plus um, from infrastructure to acquisition. We're negotiating a community benefit agreement with a coalition of community organizations called the Healthy Communities Coalition. And those negotiations range um, it's not just community benefits tied to construction equity, but through to services and workforce opportunities through to the marketing of our affordable housing. We actually co-own the site with the Portland Housing Bureau. So there's long-term affordable housing that will be part of the redevelopment and it's baked in, but also thinking about how those units are marketed and to whom based on historic communities in Old Town, all the way through to thinking about commercial affordability and how are we providing opportunities for small business tenants who might not otherwise have access to a downtown location. Now, um, as with many projects uh, tied to development, the market has shifted during COVID. And so the success kind of our success into the future as we continue to implement this project is really gonna rely on delivering both a financially feasible project and balancing that with community benefits that are commensurate with the public investment in the project. With that, I think I will hand it back. Amazing, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and that just makes me think a lot about the Toronto Community Benefits Network, who's been doing a lot of work um, to, to also uh, encourage uh, inclusion in these areas. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next presenter. So we have Laura Rampel from the city of Winnipeg. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with the esteemed colleagues. Uh, it's great to learn from all of you. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I just want to situate uh, Winnipeg, uh, and it's located in Treaty 1 territory at the home and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Indian, Yu, and Dakota peoples, and in the national homeland of the Red River Metis. 
and our clean drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation and Treaty 3 territory um, on the uh, boundary of Manitoba and Ontario. Uh, I am a third generation settler on these lands and have personally benefited from uh, white supremacy and colonial systems that have enabled the privileged position that I have or that I have today. Uh, and with that privilege, I have the responsibility to critically question and change those systems, continue learning and unlearning, and integrate reconciliation into my personal and professional life. So I've been asked to focus on reconciliation components of the R Winnipeg 2045 development plan, because Winnipeg has a large urban Indigenous population, and significant efforts have been taken by the city to prioritize truth and reconciliation. And there have been a number of initiatives, and so uh, they have influenced the R Winnipeg plan, and, and some of the policies have been elevated and integrated into it. So I'll just mention a few of them, and uh, provide links in the chat afterwards. Uh, we've developed an Indigenous Accord, um, which is uh, it connects Indigenous and non-Indigenous Winnipeggers and organizations to come together to explore reconciliation and commit to action. There's the Welcoming Winnipeg Initiative, which helps to ensure that the contributions, experiences, and perspectives of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit are reflected truthfully in our stories, historical markers, and place names. Uh, we've also uh, recently approved a 10-year poverty reduction strategy uh, that is steeped in Indigenous knowledge and co-creation, with one main focus being Indigenous children, youth, and families. And uh, last week, you may have also heard on the national news that the Hudson's Bay building ownership in downtown Winnipeg has been transferred to the Southern Chiefs organization, uh, which is quite historic. Uh, and the city is one of many stakeholders contribu contributing to seeing uh, the Southern Chiefs uh, vision realized. So that's very exciting for us. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll just start uh, by taking care of some basics in uh, the hierarchy structures, uh, if they might be different from Manitoba to Ontario or uh, other folks we've got in the crowd. Uh, our Winnipeg 2045 is a city charter required citywide development plan bylaw that guides everything the city does. It's social, environment, environmental, economic, and physical land use. Uh, we also have a more specific focused secondary plan bylaw called Complete Communities that unpacks the land use specific policy that is uh, highlighted in our Winnipeg. So they work in partnership. Uh, the pyramid in the middle demonstrates the cascade down from the high level goals and policy in our Winnipeg down to the planning tools that in order to implement them. Uh, it's a bit too detailed to get into it now, but the governance and the management uh, text uh, to the left and right of the pyramid highlight the importance of alignment and integration of our Winnipeg into existing decision making processes. Next slide, please. We began this journey in 2016 uh, with research and public engagement. It was intended to be a tweak uh, to the previous development plan, but due to the co-creation process, it took a lot more time. We built agreements on the plan vision and policy directions, which resulted in minimal opposition during the approvals process. And we are now in the final approvals phase and anticipate provincial approval and council third reading shortly. So we aren't at a stage where I can share how well we have done implementing the equity based policy um, as it is still being tested, but I can share process and lessons learned uh, to increase equity and reconciliation and this slide. Uh, shows some of the highlights of the plan. Uh, we've used a localized set of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a framework to shape the whole plan. The process of policy co-creation has reflected community needs and promoted the alignment with other plans, strategies, and processes. Our Winnipeg prioritizes equity and human rights in order to elevate the needs of the most vulnerable Winnipeggers to leave no one behind. Our Winnipeg enables reconciliation, climate action, and poverty reduction as economic drivers. We also try to embed a few tarts uh, into the plan, although we have uh, many more that we will need to set uh, in order to be accountable to our residents. The plan commits to implementation through a strategic priorities action plan process and resulting plan, which has just been initiated and intends to align with our four-year, multi-year budget cycle, 
an update of our corporate strategic plan and a newly elected mayor and council in October of this year. Next slide, please. The localized set of six sustainable development goals on the left were synthesized from the 17 UN goals, and they are leadership and good governance, environmental resilience, economic prosperity, good health and well being, social equity, and city building. Uh, the goals are intersectional and intergenerational and were useful as an organizing framework to build a foundation for nonpartisan agreement. We are aware that priority setting and how we achieve the goals will be. Uh, more challenging and more political, but we're looking forward to that challenge. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the resulting conversation. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think uh, it's fair to say that you are making many uh, Toronto Winnipeggers proud. Um, so we only have time for one question. Um, and I think we'll, we'll try to um, maybe cap the, the, the moderated conversation uh, to end at about 12.55. Um, so my one question, and you know, maybe we'll roll into others, how are non-governmental and community partners involved in implementing the plan or strategy? And I'd actually like to start with uh, Laura, if, you, if you're able, if you're still there, um, because in Winnipeg, the uh, focus on reconciliation really sparked our interest here. So. I would love to hear about how um, Indigenous organizations were part of the plan of uh, our Winnipeg. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, important to us to try to engage as many folks as possible and, and have that uh, representation and diversity. Um, best laid plans don't always work as intended, uh, but we were able to connect with a number of Indigenous based organizations. Um, when we were visioning, we connected with uh, Mayor Brian Bowman's Indigenous Advisory Circle and uh, received their guidance, which was really important. Um, targeted uh, or went to Indigenous residents at community events um, to, to speak with them. A uh, number of, we, uh, we had a community advisory committee as well that had Indigenous representation. Um, there's, we had what we called anchor institutions um, who we co-created policy with in a much more um, informal and back and forth uh, way. And so uh, folks like the Winnipeg Indigenous Executive Circle uh, participated in, in that and received confidential drafts along the way so that we could uh, integrate their feedback. So that was extremely valuable. Um, and then on the government to government, relationship side, uh, we were able to connect with the Manitoba Métis Federation um, and learn how they would like to be consulted uh, because they have uh, what's called Resolution 8 framework, uh, which identifies five phases of, of consultation and engagement uh, that they uh, on how they would like to participate mm -hmm. in such processes. And so uh, we didn't always get it right, but we we worked hard to learn and uh, and respond appropriately. So many lessons for the next time around and an ongoing relationship and trust building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the key is always to, to keep learning. Um, and so it's one of the things I heard from your response is that um, it was an ongoing dialogue. So it wasn't a, you know, we're going to drop this over here for you to send a couple comments and then we're going to take it back and then you know, you're going to see the end result, but it was it seemed like it was more of a dialogue of this is what we're thinking and they can actually pull it apart a little bit and make comments. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, I think we shared two or three policy drafts with uh, the anchor institution so uh, they could see how we integrated their their feedback at multiple stages and um, could tweak it and make suggestions recommendations. Mm -hmm. so, so I'll open this question up to the other members of the panel. So. Uh, from your experience, what has been uh, the best way to uh, implement effective relationships with uh, external organizations to uh, implement, implement diversity, equity, inclusion in your uh, planning processes? I'm happy to jump in and just offer that um, what was really critical for us in our process was um, adopting an engagement strategy on the front end 
that our city council blessed. Um, so we very clearly outlined how we would um, prioritize um, engaging with uh, communities of color and and um, not rely on old structures that had gotten us to our current um, uh, state. And then moving forward onto implementation, about the same time that our policy document was adopted, our city council adopted um, uh, a best practice that we're required to, uh, as, we're, as we're working on implementation, bringing new regulations forward um, and implementing the policies of the plan, we need to uh, do a racial uh, equity impact assessment on every single piece of uh, legislation we bring to the city council, which uh, requires us to provide data on how uh, the work will impact um, our diverse communities and, um, and to explain how we've engaged our, our diverse communities to come to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do. I can um, jump in with a few thoughts too, and, and to be totally candid and honest, right, I feel like it's an ongoing lesson that we're trying to learn of how to build those effective relationships and how to bridge the, bro the broken trust that runs deep. Um, and um, if I'm just to reflect a little bit, I think, you know, we have been working very closely with uh, our, with a coalition of community and city organizations. Um, I feel that people have been most responsive and appreciative of the trans of tra as much transparency as we're able to offer, as well as showing um, our commitment to um, different processes. So, like I think we've already heard several several people mention racial equity impact assessments. We are as part of our implementation as well. We are currently in the midst of conducting a health and racial equity impact assessment on some proposed land use changes that would reflect the ETOD policy plan that we've put in place. Um, and so I think it's a mix of both, uh, you know, these new community driven processes, um, being as transparent as possible. Um, accountability obviously is like is, is big, important and a big um, theme that is that is sometimes can be challenging to, you know, figure out how to operationalize as well. But I think the openness to like, trying to figure out what that way of working is, is appreciated by um, our, at least here, our, our partners on the ground. Maybe I'll just build on that because I would say a plus one to everything Juan just said is, I think time, right? I mean, as particularly on the public sector side, there are many years of um, detrimental impact and we have to own that. And it's not gonna, we're not gonna change those relationships in five years. This is really kind of a time commitment that moves beyond political timelines. The second I would say is resourcing community capacity. So we found that it's really important that you were actually providing direct funding to community-based organizations for staffing all the way through to honorarium. So if they're participating on committees that we're honoring um, the technical and lived experience that they're bringing to bear. And last, because I think particularly in the US, this is something that we always tend to highlight, the role, the key role of the private sector in really for us to successfully scale DEI initiatives out of the public sector into the private sector is a really important transition. And so looking for all opportunities where we can either incent or require kind of the private sector to move there with us is really critical to actually see scaled change. Amazing. So some of the things I was hearing there was just having the, the bravery or the like to be uncomfortable, to make mistakes, at least to try, right? Like just go ahead and try, and then you can always reevaluate and to improve over time. Um, and Lisa, I do really appreciate your comment about the, the public partnership with the private sector. Uh, we're really fortunate in Toronto to have, I would say, a pretty um, you know conscious private sector that is aware that um, you know inclusion, diversity, inclusion is something that should be part of their uh, core operation and leaning into that that space for themselves. So I hope that inspired uh, many of our members of the audience who are in the private sector to think about how can you be a partner to the public sector. Um, and so with that, I'm going to close it off um, this panel. So thank you so much, Laura, Joe, John, Sebastian and Lisa for for your time and sharing your amazing knowledge with us all. I really, really appreciate it. And um, so th thank you so much. Um, and with that, I'm going to be move, uh, transitioning on to the co-chairs of the ULI Diversity, Inclusion and Equity Committee, Liliana and uh, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. 
Um, on behalf of ULI Toronto, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today from Chicago, Minneapolis, Portland, and Winnipeg. You all shared incredibly important insight with all of our attendees. And as a planner working for a municipality, I often find myself wrestling with the questions that were brought up by Janija at the beginning of our session. It's really coming to full circle in the planner speak, I guess. How do we plan for diverse, equitable, inclusive communities for future generations while really acknowledging truthfully and authentically those that came before us? What tools do we have at our disposal to get us from where we are today to where we want to be in the future? In other words, how do we ensure that the cake is not pre-baked using those terms that were used at the beginning? So from our panelists today, we have a glimpse of how it can be done. From Chicago, we learned of how the city utilizes an equitable transit-oriented development plan as a tool to advance the city's affordability, wealth building, public health and climate resiliency goals. From Minneapolis, we learned that adopting an equity plan is as important as its process in which the plan is being developed in that it requires that we engage early on and with everybody and in particular, the targeted and impacted groups, the underrepresented and bringing those stories that have not been heard into light requires that we have champions and support of our elected officials and requires that we need to acknowledge that change is necessary to achieve these goals we've identified in our plans. From Portland, we learned about the importance of applying the equity and accountability lens to balance the risk with financial return and public and community benefits and efforts to plan towards an equitable economy. And last but not least, we learned of the importance of recognizing equity and prioritizing truth and reconciliation from the inception of the plan as a component of the Winnipeg 2045 plan. So the result is a plan that embeds the indigenous knowledge and wisdom and authentically and truthfully reflect that in every aspect of the plan. So thank you and congratulations to all the great work that these panelists have brought. And thank you as well to all those who found the time in your busy schedules to come and learn with us as we embark on the DEI and 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 R journey. Um, more to come from us, so stay tuned. And now I pass it back on to my colleague, Kelly, for her closing remarks. Thanks. Thanks, Liliana. I know we've got we've got quite a reputation to uphold with ULI's webinars ending on time. So just uh, a last quick comment from me, a reminder that we will be planning a follow-up workshop, um, which will be an opportunity for everyone to come together and collaborate on some of the ideas that we've heard today and how we could potentially implement them here in our region in our backyards. And to help us shape the workshop, um, as you leave, there will be a post-webinar survey prompted. Um, so we'd appreciate if you'd take a few minutes to submit your thoughts and comments and also um, all the resources have been posted in the chat from, from our panelists. So, so please um, check those out on your own time. We've got a couple of exciting upcoming events with ULI Toronto, so be sure to check them out. Um, you can register for any of them by following the links which will be posted in the chat. And um, with that, I guess that that's it for me. It's one o'clock and uh, we really thank you a lot for joining us today. It was a great conversation and that we learned a lot and we look forward to uh, having you on future webinars. With that, thank you and have a wonderful day, everyone.